Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's warm in here today. It's warmer this service. Feels like a like a womb. Uh, I don't know. So, all right. So, hopefully, uh, I don't pass out of here. All right. Uh, so, hey, we are uh, continuing in our series called Overflow. And uh, actually, Andy was supposed to be here this morning, and uh, he's not feeling too great this morning. So, first of all, if you wouldn't mind just keeping him in your prayers, uh, that he can kind of get over some of what he's got, just some cough and congestion kind of things. I know that's. Uh, a lot of people's story right now. So just keep it in your prayers. So today I'm going to be pinch hitting uh, and going through our series and hopefully trying to continue to communicate the spirit of what he was hoping to today as we continue to talk about overflow. And, and what we mean by overflow is this idea of living our lives from the overflow of our hearts, that, that we believe we serve a God who comes in and transforms us from the inside out, that through the uh, grace and mercy and compassion of Jesus, and ultimately his death on the cross, that changes our hearts from the inside out. It changes how we think. It changes what we say. It changes what we do. And that's the kind of life that we want to live, not one where we are uh, trying and, and it's our effort that is accomplishing things, but we are partnering with God in the ways that he has explained and taught through us throughout Scripture to live the life that he's called us to live, that we've been created to live. Uh, in addition to that concept, at the beginning of the year, we always like to go back and remind ourselves of what our mission and our vision is as a church. And we like to sometimes go through and unpack some of our core values. So just as a reminder, our mission here at LeClaire is we are striving to be courageous followers of Jesus who love God, love others, and prove it daily. This comes from a command that Jesus gave his disciples back in John chapter 13, shortly before he goes to the cross, and he's with them in this uh, intimate moment with just them, and, and he explains to them, he says, a, a new command I give you. And of course, they're probably thinking, oh, what possibly could he say? You know, we've been with him for years. What could be new that we haven't already heard? And he says, love one another. You've probably heard him say that a time or two, but then he qualifies that. He says, love one another as I have loved you. And I wonder if they began to think about the time that they'd, been, that they'd spent with Jesus, seeing the miracles that he's done, seeing the, the way that he's invested in their lives and walked with them and talked with them and revealed to them the truths of the kingdom of God. But little did they know that in just a few hours, Jesus was going to show the full extent of his love as he would give his life for them on the cross. So that is our, our mission. And of our mission, we have several different core values. One of those is a transforming relationship with Jesus, what we've been talking about the last couple of weeks. We desire that everybody who is a part of LeClaire enters into this consistent, continual, transforming relationship with Jesus. But today, we want to talk about another one of our core values that we see as foundational to the work that we do here. And it's this idea of authentic community. Authentic community. Now, I believe this community that we are called to be a part of the church it is a gift that God has given us to help live out our faith, to encourage one another, and to live out of the command to love one another. In fact, I wonder how many of us would still be sitting here today if it weren't for some of the relationships and if it weren't for the community of the church that maybe we've been a part of for, for many, many years. I can think about my own life, my own family, parents who consistently took my sister and I to church every single Sunday who also set an example in the ways that they served faithfully and consistently and, and, and in a committed way uh, throughout my life. I can think of youth workers and Sunday school teachers and youth ministers and uh, college roommates and uh, ministry partners that have continued to encourage me, continued to help me stay faithful and to uncover what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And I imagine that for many of you here you would have some of those very same people that come to mind. That's the power of this community. It's also a community that serves as a key testimony to the world of who God truly is. One of the key factors in living out a transforming relationship with Jesus is the community we have in the church. Jesus said that, his, uh, that to his disciples that people would know that they are followers of him by how they loved one another. This group and this community was and is intended to serve as a beacon to the rest of the world, to model the greatest form of unconditional love human beings can show to one another. Jesus also said that it would be this collective group that gathers together, that comes together, this group that is called out. That's literally what the church means, this word ecclesia, called out, that as they come together, they would be so powerful that the gates of Hades would not overcome them. 
It's for those reasons that you and I have a responsibility to strive for unity and to seek out true and authentic Jesus-minded community so that we can show what it means to lay our lives down for the benefit of others, to love others as Jesus has loved us. It's truly a beautiful thing. But as you might imagine, keeping unity among a group of people from all different backgrounds, all different histories, different experiences, different cultures, ethnicities, ideologies is no easy task. And this is why Jesus prayed so earnestly shortly before he went to the cross in John 17 for the unity of this group. Those that were there in the present moment beginning to start the church and then the future generations of the church that would be to come. To call them into this new community that would carry out his mission today. But Jesus didn't have an easy task. But somehow, out of this mess of people, the church was born. A church that exists today. A community that you and I stepped into when we said, I do, to our Savior. So how? How did Jesus take this group of a depressed and divided remnant of God's people and transform them into a vibrant kingdom-minded community that has lasted for millennia, And according to the early chapters of Acts, was known for their mutual love for one another, their fellowship, their joy, their radical generosity, their commitment and devotion to God and each other. I think perhaps if we were to survey the church today and compare it to what we read about at its inception, I think we may have some things to learn from Jesus' vision. Now, I wish I could say that the church throughout centuries has stayed faithful to this call and has looked Uh, like what Jesus intended to, but I I don't know if I can say that. And I wish I could say that the church today is an adequate representation of Christ's vision for it. But again, I don't know if I could fully go there. And that's why I love getting to do uh, sermon series like this, where we get to go back and remind ourselves who it is that we are, remind ourselves of what our true identity is. We all need that reminder from time to time. Because when we trace back those roots, we can continue to forge a unity that can help point the world to the one true Savior. Now, I've often thought about the time in which Jesus came into the world and why why God chose that specific time and place for Jesus to come and fulfill the ultimate purpose of dying on the cross to to save us from our sins. I often wonder why he came during that time. And you know, thinking about God's people, it would maybe make sense that he would have come at another time in Israel's history. You know, if you're there to create this new kingdom, create this new community, maybe it would have made sense to, to go back in, in time where, where God's people were a little more united. Uh, I think about maybe the time after they were delivered from Egypt and after they wandered through the wilderness. Kind of during that difficult period, they were able to develop this heart for God as they were getting ready to go into the promised land. Like, that would have made a lot more sense for Jesus to come then. Or maybe centuries later, when, when King David was on the throne and we see the success of, of the nation of Israel, it's expanding its borders, and there's this unity that exists, maybe that would have been a better time to form a church. Or maybe even after the exile, after a difficult period of, of being in captivity under the, the nation of Babylon, there's this time where, where they, the, the people are allowed to come back together to kind of reestablish themselves in Jerusalem. Uh, things weren't quite as good as they were before, but there still was this spirit of cohesion among the people. And maybe that would have been a better time for Jesus to come. But this was not the world that Jesus came into. In fact, one might even say that The time Jesus arrived was maybe the worst time because this community of God's people, the Israelites, were so divided. Over the previous four to five centuries, they had rebuilt the city of Jerusalem and the temple, and they had reclaimed a region of their own. But after years of wars, both foreign and civil, their group identity paled in comparison to the former former glory days of their past. No longer self-governing, they were subject to to the powerful Roman Empire, this nation that God had called out with a mighty hand and outstretched arm through miraculous works in Egypt that was to be a light to the rest of the world as Isaiah prophesied, looked to barely be hanging on. 
Instead of leading the world to know God, they were more of this annoying thorn in the side of the Roman Empire. Instead of being a blessing to the world, as God told Abraham they would be in Genesis chapter 12, they were more of a disgrace. Now, when Jesus arrives, this community of Jewish people were on all sides of every issue. There were the religious leaders who held influence among the people at large, but they were divided into two main groups. You had one group, the Pharisees, who cared deeply about the righteousness of people, or at least they said so. Uh, They sought to uphold the teachings of Scripture. They established synagogues all over the region so that people could come and learn and know the Word of God. Because rightly so, as they went back through history and saw the moments where Israel began to crumble, it had much to do with their lack of obedience to God. They saw Israel's need to obey God as a primary focus. And I think the intention was right because this was always their problem before. But their desire for obedience led to a certain self-righteousness and an impressive legalism that extended beyond the requirements of the law of Moses received centuries before. They put themselves in the driver's seat of righteousness instead of faithfully being led by God. And then there were the Sadducees. They were the ruling group that held a majority of the power, the political power over Judea. They were this wealthy group that didn't believe in all the writings of the Old Testament. And so the Pharisees and Sadducees often argued about theological issues. But the two parties had to somehow find ways to work together to lead the people. Now the Sadducees also had power over the temple and over uh, the, the system of worship. And they were a lot more closely aligned with the Roman Empire, who, who promised to leave them alone if, if everything just stayed under control. So compared to the Pharisees, they had a, a lukewarm devotion to their faith. If sacrificing some obedience to God and capitulating to the culture of the day meant keeping peace with Rome and keeping peace with the audience of, of people and pleasing them, this was generally fine with them. So you can see how just within these two groups, how difficult it would be to lead people. And the Sadducees then hated the Zealots, as their name implies. This was a group of Jews that hated the Roman Empire with a passion. If there was any group to orchestrate riots and violence to overthrow the Romans, it was them. They saw the Roman oppression as a great evil, and they were okay using some activist force to gain back their independence. After all, God had delivered Israel's enemies into their hands in the past, so why not again? And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have the Essenes. These were Jews who found solace in simply removing themselves from the rest of the Jewish world. They were spiritual and devoted to God, but were so fed up with the other groups and what they believed to be corrupt temple worship that by the time Jesus' arrival They were living in their own communities out in the desert, completely separating themselves from everyone else. Is this sounding familiar? Now, this isn't even an exhaustive list of what compromised the nature of the Jewish people in Jesus' day. These groups didn't always see eye to eye, and the differences between them began to separate this whole community. So what a time to try to come and start a church. But God always keeps his promises. And he promised that this group would be that light. Where Israel had failed, Isaiah prophesied of a coming Messiah who would not only restore this group, but would carry on the mission to the rest of the world. If the Jewish people could not act as one, how on earth could this group extend to those outside of them? How on earth could they be a light to the rest of the world? But listen to what Isaiah says about Jesus in Isaiah 49, 6. He says, It is too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. So when Jesus came to earth to see people come to repentance, through his sacrifice on the cross, he came to build a church and renew a broken community to facilitate the spread of of this message. And his methods were unlike anything the world had seen because he was bringing something unlike anything the world had seen. A heavenly kingdom established on earth. And if we want to continue to build and foster authentic community, 
We can't do that without trusting and submitting the ways in which Jesus brought people together. He came to set God's plan back in motion to remind men and women, you and I, that when we step out in faith and join the ranks of God's people, we are adopted into and grafted into this group. We begin the same mission that God had established when Israel began. Through Jesus, God had created a new Israel that would be formed of people from all nationalities, from all over the world, who would truly be a light to the rest of the world. Galatians 3.29 says, If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. That becomes the ultimate identity for those that choose to follow Christ. Just as the Israelites were called out, we too have been called out in obedience to carry out the spread of the gospel. And a strong and united church can have limitless, limitless impact in helping point the world to Jesus. So, how did Jesus go about accomplishing this? First of all, there are a couple things. One, Jesus always pointed to the bigger picture. Jesus always pointed to a bigger picture. Far too often, our disputes or divisions with one another come from a myopic view of the kingdom that Jesus came to bring. Uh, the truth of the kingdom of God was massive, and it, it, it infiltrates societies and people. And it, it was so, so big that Jesus had to break it down into parables to teach everybody just exactly what it is that he came to bring. To teach truths like uh, the kingdom, it begins small like a mustard seed, but yet it grows and grows and expands, and its branches reach out in all directions like a growing tree. Truth of how it's like yeast that, that can permeate a piece of dough and, and, and permeate throughout the whole entire thing, affecting uh, entire lives and entire groups of people. Truths that like, if you find this, it's worth so much, like a treasure that you might find, that, that you go and bury it and sell everything you have and buy the field and the place that you buried it so you never, ever lose it. It's a kingdom that doesn't just judge men on the basis of earthly standards and divisions, that even the most unlikely people who may have little to offer this world from an earthly standpoint have just as much access to it as anyone else and actually probably have the humble mindset to see it more clearly when it does come. This kingdom had the power to dissolve the divisions and labels of the day because it brought a new identity to its members that far surpassed all others. And Jesus began to model this kingdom in the way that he lived and in the people he associated with. In fact, just looking at the 12 apostles that Jesus chose, you can see this diversity of individuals that, that are there, from uh, a tax collector who so many would have considered like a traitor to their people, to someone like a zealot, the far other extreme. Can you imagine the conversations that were had around the campfire? However, Jesus knew the truth he came to bring was big enough to leave these labels void of power. For this reason, politics no longer needed to divide because the kingdom superseded all. Physical boundaries no longer needed to divide because his kingdom was spiritual, not determined by the bounds of geography. Ethnicity no longer needed to divide because this kingdom is open to people of all nations, reversing the consequences of proud humanity at the Tower of Babel. And reminding us of the truth that we all came from the same man. Paul realized this when he says in Galatians chapter 3, just a couple of verses prior to what I read earlier. He says, so in Christ you are all children of God through faith. And for all of you who were baptized into Christ have now clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free. Nor is there male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. When you step into this kingdom, all dividing lines created by sinful humanity melt away, and we no longer need to think, speak, and live by them. Ephesians 2, uh, Paul's also uh, addressing another church here in Ephesus, and, and he's addressing the tension that exists when you're bringing two different groups of people together on, under one umbrella, the Jews and the Gentiles. This is what he says. For he himself, Jesus, is our peace. Uh, the peace that Paul is talking about here is, is not the peace that we get between us and God that Christ's death brings. That is true. But the peace he's talking about that also comes, that sometimes we uh, fail to discuss as much as maybe we should, is the peace that comes among one another here in the church. 
who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to those who were far away and peace to those who were near, for through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. For this Jesus community to thrive, like Christ, we have to continually point to a greater truth, a greater identity, the greater reality that comes in his kingdom and leave our earthly ways of viewing one another and dividing one another behind. As we continue to consider how this new community began, it's also it's important to note that Jesus had a big vision. But this, it was a big kingdom, but he accomplished this vision through small means. Jesus accomplished a big vision through small means. He started with just a group of 12 ordinary men. He didn't picket the political powers of the day or try to persuade one or the other Jewish ruling party, the Pharisees or Sadducees. He poured into his own small group of men that the rest of the world saw as likely having very little, if any, influence at all. And in fact, Luke 12, 32 uses an endearing term. Jesus refers to this group as his little flock, like a shepherd with a small group of sheep. That's what he had. And it's with this small group that Jesus began renewing a nation and building a kingdom from the inside out. If Jesus had come in with power and persuasion, had he valued a large platform above people as his sole purpose in starting a kingdom, I'm not sure if it, if it would have been possible for him to adequately display the type of love he came to show, the kind of love that would bring out about true transformation. But in order to make sure his message carried on, he poured into this small group. Now, as we have discussed previously in, in this series, he, he told them to love one another as I have loved you. And this love came through time spent together, sacrificing for one another, the type of love that's needed to transform lives. The type of love that's able to walk alongside somebody in their most difficult times. It doesn't miss the one for the sake of the 99. It had to start with this small community. It began with these close relationships. Because discipleship does not happen at a distance. If you want to see change happen, if you want to see God's kingdom thrive in the culture and community that you live in, whether it's your workplace, your school, your city, your state, it begins with something small. You may not be able to change the ways of a nation, but you can impact the life of a child, of a student, here at LeClaire, a neighbor, a family member, and those you see on a daily basis. This is why at LeClaire we have our life group ministry. Uh, this year, as a staff, we've, we've continued to think about what direction are we headed in and where is God leading. And, and, and part of that, an integral part of that, is, is our small groups here at LeClaire. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, we, we have a couple places for people to plug in and to uh, create a small group of their own. Like, we know that we have the kind of size church that if you walk into service on a Sunday morning, it's really easy to come, sing, praise, listen to a sermon, and then leave without having meaningful interaction with people around you. Uh, but I don't believe this is the kind of life, the kind of authentic community that God has called us to live. And so here we have a couple of options. We've got life groups, which are, are groups of people that do life together. They meet together on a regular basis to encourage one another, to pray for one another. And then we have some classes in Bible studies where community can be formed as well, but just has a little more emphasis on, on education and on knowledge and on learning God's word. And we want everybody here to, to plug in and to be involved in one of those. As it stands now, we have about 37% of our of our adults that are plugged into a, a life group or a class. And, and we have a, a goal this year of trying to get that to 45%. Uh, because we know and believe in the value that this can bring to individuals' lives. Uh, so today, I know last week we had a card available in the pew in front of you. But there is again another card that uh, is different from last week that is all about plugging into community. There are some brochures there that, that talk about some of the options that are available, and then there's a card. If, if, if you're at a place in your life where, you know, maybe you've thought about jumping in and you're just not quite sure, man, we would love for you to make that 
make that choice. Uh, you can look right there on that card and, and check something and just drop it in the box as you leave today. And we'll be doing sign-ups the next couple of weeks, so if you need time to think about it, uh, you've got that. But we'd love for you to participate in that. And we've got several options there that are, are available. For me in my own life, uh, some of the most influential people are not people that are maybe have a big stage in the church, but it's the people that I've done life with on a daily basis. They're the ones who have the most influence in my life uh, to encourage me and um, share wisdom with me, and, and we want the very same for you here. As we seek, uh, as we seek this as a church, don't undervalue how big, how a big vision sometimes is accomplished through small means. Now, I know that many of you watch uh, a show called The Chosen. It's been around for a few years now. My wife and I uh, have watched through most of it, and it's really just kind of a retelling of, of Jesus' life. There takes some poetic license uh, on some of the disciples' lives and kind of, you know, makes up a backstory with them. Uh, but one of the things that uh, I, I like about this show is that in the first season or two, as, as these individuals come and encounter Jesus for the first time, we begin to see that they, uh, they had a, a lot of priorities in their life. And then all of a sudden, after this encounter with Jesus, everything changes. And what once was important uh, priorities that they had, now this kingdom that Jesus brings becomes everything. We may not have all of their full biographies but we know that Christ and his kingdom become the ultimate purpose for them. So much that they're willing to give their lives for it. When God's people come to a place of full submission to Jesus and his kingdom, it unites us like nothing else can. And we want to invite you to be a part of that. Now in this series, at the end of every sermon, we always like to go back through our partner's commitment. This is a commitment for those that have gone through our Discover Leclerc class that we present and share. And at the beginning of every year, we always like to go back to this to remind us of what it is that we're committing to here as a church. And so I just want to take a moment to read that with you this morning. I think we have it on the screen here. It says, I'll be faithful with the gifts God has entrusted to me in order to make the body complete. When another part of the body is hurting or down, I will do what I can to lift them up. I will be an encourager. I will always be welcoming of new people, regardless of where they're from or their walk of life. I will handle any and all tension that comes my way with love. I will do all this because I believe that Jesus is the hope of the world and we, his church, are the vehicle he has chosen to share that hope. And that's a big deal. Now, in just a moment, we're going to sing a song. And, and I just want to encourage you, if there's anything going on in your life that we can be praying about, I'll be up front, Trey will be up here as well. We'd love to do that, to help be a part of, of this community for you. Or if you have any other decisions to make, or um, maybe you've never made that commitment to completely surrender your life to Jesus, we'd love to talk to you about what that looks like as well. But let me pray for us this morning, and then we can sing our final song. God, we're grateful for who you are and, and we're grateful for the gift of community that you give us. You've created us to do life with other people. We aren't meant to live in isolation. We're not meant to live alone. But you empower us and you give us the gifts to contribute to this group. And it is this group and the love that we show for one another that, that is so compelling to the world around us. Even in times when the church is criticized for various things, I pray that it is the unity of this community that shines brightly, that tells a different story, that tells the true story of who you are. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.